Well, welcome and good morning to the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. Um, if you were hoping to see Father Chris, I'm not Father Chris, okay? But, um, but I'm helping him out. He's giving a, a mission or a talk in North Carolina, and he asked me to, if I could step in and give a talk of some sort, and I'm gonna give my testimony today, so I'm sorry if you were looking for Father Chris, but I'm gonna try my best with the Lord, okay? What I also wanna mention is that this talk was in my heart, and I spoke with Father Chris, I really wanted to reach out to the youth. God has put it on my heart. I did a lot of work with uh, missionary work, with focus, um, and things like that. The Fellowship of Catholic University students, it's always been on my heart. I came back to my faith mainly in college, that's when the big change happened in my life, but you're going to hear about that in the testimony. But let's first say a prayer, okay? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, I trust in you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Simple. That's it. That's it. Our Father already wants to give us everything we need. Jesus, I trust in you. Sometimes that's all it is. And so that's where I want to begin, that as humans, our issue at the root level is a problem of disobedience and trust in God's goodness. So we want to focus on the goodness of God. I mean, if you get anything out of this talk, that's great, but if it helps you get closer to God, it's because God is moving in your heart, not me. I can't cause any growth, neither can anybody nor any saint. God causes any growth. But we throw out seeds. And, and as St. Paul says, you know, right, we can water like a plant, right? But we can't cause any growth. So if God works in the middle of me yawning, and that's where you feel like, oh, wow, I just got a brilliant thought about Jesus. He loves me. Well, there you go. It's very clear God is causing the growth, and I kind of hope that happens so we can stay focused on Jesus, okay? We turn to our Blessed Mother who loves us so much. She is so mighty before God, but at the same time, she knows her nothingness. She's a real person. She's lowly. She's humble. But she trusts also Jesus completely. She's the masterpiece of mercy. So some people can see me or any priest with a collar, right? They could think he grew up in a family where he always went to church. In my case, not the case. Well, he must have always prayed before meals. Not the case, didn't pray before meals. He must have at least altar served. Absolutely not, I avoided that like nobody's business. Absolutely not. The first time I altar served, I was 22 and it wasn't my choice. I said yes, but I kind of felt like I got duped into it. Yeah, I almost fell over. I was so stiff and nervous. So did I grow up in a church? No. Did I go to Catholic school? I went to Catholic school. But let's begin first with this, okay? Did I go to Sunday Mass growing up? Yes and no. With my immediate family, my parents and my brother, no. Christmas and Easter and sometimes only Christmas. Did I go to confession when my grade school made us go? And then I'd say the S word, you know, walking across the street, and I'd be like, man, dang, I was clean, I was pure, I thought I was right with God, and I already messed it up five minutes after confession. And then that kind of like set in like, ugh, it's kind of discouraging, and so then it was easier to just kind of give in to it. You see how that works? If we lose heart, if we lose trust in the goodness of God, we focus on ourself, our weakness, our limitations, our sins, and there's no power there for salvation. There's no remedy there. It's worse than a dead end. Okay? We have to keep our eyes on Jesus, and he's here. He's right behind me in a sacramental way. He's right before you in a sacramental way. He brought you here. I don't fully know why, but he did. He didn't force you. He brought you here for a reason. He brought me here for a reason. He's up to something, and that's our trust. That's our joy, that's our hope. So my yes and no. The yes for mass growing up was when we would go to my grandma and grandpa's, and they would, they would go to mass at St. Matthew's Catholic Church down the street, 
I couldn't receive communion. I always wanted to as a kid because the, the, the grown-ups did, and it looked cool, and it seemed powerful, and it seemed special, and I had a childlike faith. That's Jesus. That's what I've been taught. I want to do that. I want to receive Jesus. I want to receive communion like the old people. I want to be like a big boy. But really what I was focused on was, man, I can't wait for that Dunkin' Donuts after Mass. And they were good. Dunkin' Donuts galore. I mean, you had boxes of the old Dunkin' Donuts. The old Dunkin' Donuts, not the kind that are now flat box. This was like the square like tank box, which I miss. You got powdered sugar and you got sugar raised. They're in a box, you've got now mix. You have powdered sugar on sugar raised and the sugar on powdered sugar. It's just how it was, loved it. They had gallons of whole milk, loved it. Milk and donuts, old people everywhere. They were sweet and kind. We were just little ones, so they all loved us. My brother and I just stuffing our faces with donuts. That is mainly what I remember from Catholic Mass. I was a kid. Mass was difficult. I didn't understand what was going on. I had no idea, at least I don't remember, that it was the sacrifice of Jesus. I was thinking, let's just get through this. I can't wait till it's over because I was tired by the end, and man, I need those donuts. I can't wait for those donuts. That was me, Sunday Mass, growing up. And then, like any person, I was normal. I mean, right? Some people like sports, some people maybe don't like sports, but just like an average kid, I loved sports, loved football, hockey, baseball, all the stuff my dad showed me. And I loved playing sports. We'd play until the sun went down. And when the sun went down, I'd be kind of depressed because we couldn't play sports anymore. Throw the football until your arm hurt. And my brother was the receiver. He became a great receiver because I would just like fire the ball at him all the time. And I didn't become a good receiver because I always made myself quarterback. Poor guy. But he became good at catching the football. Very good at catching the football. Okay? Just like any ordinary kid, we played football in front of our house, broke my tooth, got hit right underneath the chin, knocked out one third of my front tooth. So my front tooth is fake. Half a, quarter, a third of it is fake. That's why when I eat apples, if you ever see me, I don't bite down the middle. I always bite off to the side. So if anybody sees me, that's why. Because I don't want to break the fake tooth. Yeah, I caught it. I caught the tooth. This is real deal. I brought it home and I saw my mom I was kind of thinking it was cool. I was kind of upset. She started to cry, and then I got all kind of teary-eyed because I lost my tooth. Anyway, this is real life. Broke my arm, major an injuries on ankles, just regular stuff that happens to kids. Can't walk for six months because you probably tore tendons. All these kinds of normal things that kids do, right? Just a normal person. I did not want to be a priest. Are you kidding me? A priest, please. If you've seen, I, I shared on EWTN for the first time ever, like in more large part of what happened to me with the calling. My desire for priesthood, it's kind of a little bit of like a little exaggerated, but it was about as close as to my desire of wanting to go to hell. All right? Like, I don't want to go to hell. I didn't want to be a priest. It's just that simple. I didn't cross my mind. And I thought because I don't altar serve, I'm not going to be a priest. They say the ones who altar serve are going to be the priests. I'm not altar serving. Great. I'm not going to be a priest. And I relished in that. I didn't think about it. Pray for my vocation. I didn't even know what a vocation was. I wouldn't have known what the word meant. I don't even know if I would have known how to pronounce it. Vocation? What does that even mean? Vocation. Ask God what he wants me to do for my life. I do what I want. I don't ask God. That's not even on my radar screen. Nobody tells me what to do. I do whatever I want to do. That's how I lived. That's how I lived. Nobody tells me what to do. I got a stubborn streak. God had to work a lot, and he still has to work at me. My mom is from Italy, and we'd go every summer to, to Italy to visit my grandmother. I only have first cousins in Italy. My, whole, my uh, mom's whole side of her family is in Italy. She has no family here in the States. She moved here when she was in her 20s. She met my dad over there because he was a medical student. 
they got engaged, they got married, and he wanted to start the family in the States, and she followed him. And that's where we were raised. I was born in Staten Island, New York, but then my dad wanted to follow, because my dad's from New York. He was born in the Bronx, grew up in New Rochelle, went to Fordham, then went to St. Michael's in Vermont, and then applied and got into the university in Sardinia, Italy, where my mom is from, the island underneath Corsica. But his dream was to get to the University of Roma, Rome. And he got there, and that's where he graduated from. And he had to pass the exam for medical license in Rome, in Italy, to practice in Italy. But to get back to the States, you also have to pass the boards, the medical license exam for the USA. And so he had to pass that too, and God opened that door, and he did pass both so he could raise his family in the United States. But he could have practiced in both countries. And so, but his parents, his uncle, uh, moved from New York, where a lot of Italians in our family, 99.9% .9 Italian. And they moved from Florida, from New York to Florida, and he wanted to raise the family down in Florida. So I was not even two years old when we moved to South Florida, and I grew up in Fort Lauderdale. Yes, people live in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> I tell that to people and they go, people, you know, sometimes people live there. I'm like, yeah, I did. It's awesome. Loved it. Palm trees, coconuts, wonderful restaurants, the beach about a mile away. Oh, it was awesome. Summer all year, you can play sports all year. Are you kidding me? Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Tropical fruit. Oh my goodness. Part of me thinks part of the reason I'm not going to go to purgatory is because I had to leave that. I had to leave Florida. That's right, and live in the cold for the last like 15 years. And I love snow, but I miss Florida. But I miss my family more than Florida. Okay? So we'd go to Italy and we'd spend a couple weeks with my grandma, cousins, soccer, all that stuff. Just normal stuff. Soccer is huge there, so we would play soccer. Go have dinner with the family at night, eat all the wonderful food, then go bit, get bit by all the mosquitoes out on the, on the soccer field at night and play and play and play until mom and dad and our aunts and uncles were done talking and hanging out and drinking the grappa and, and, and just celebrating like Italians do. Because they'd only see each other for two, three weeks a year, family. So they were, it was always celebration. Because it's not very much to be with your family, your immediate family. And so we would play soccer, and that's what we would do. And then for about a week out of those three weeks, my dad would uh, pick a part of Italy, five days maybe, and we would go see a new part of Italy because we always spent it with my grandma and just her, her, my mom's hometown. So he wanted to see Italy. And one year we went to Florence, and we would visit churches, and I hated it. I hated it. Oh gosh, I hated it, like another church. I, I hate this. I can't take it anymore. My brother and I'd be like, can we please go to McDonald's? And with all the wonderful pasta and it was good food and I liked it. But after like 12 days of it, I was like, please, Big Mac, please. I can't take it anymore. My dad cracked one day and he said, fine. And we were in Milan that one time, we went to McDonald's. So, so look. We'd go to churches. I didn't realize until about 10 years after this happened, I was around like 10 or 12, we were at this famous church that is sometimes called Il Duomo because it has a very famous dome. It's enormous. It was built about 500 years ago. It's like Renaissance style, I think. The church is called Santa, Mia, Santa Maria del Fiore. It's like St. Mary of the Flower. Beautiful. It's, it's spectacular, but I could not have seen that on my own power. I hated seeing the churches. I was so bored. And that one day, we got up to the church. Ten years later, I realized it was a grace. I didn't know it was a grace. I don't think I, I, I did not know what grace was. I had heard about it. I knew it was good, I think. But I didn't know it was like God intervening in your life. How could I, unless I was told? I didn't know that God was healing me and setting me free from something that didn't, he didn't want in my life, to hate churches to feel like you can't stand being there, to be so bored inside of uh, uh, his father's home, that's not right. Something's wrong. I didn't know. And I saw the facade of the church. It's now my, it's my favorite church. Um, my dream is, if God gives it to me, is to celebrate a, a Christmas night mass one time in my life. That's, where, that's my dream. And I saw the facade, and it was just, it was like, 
beautiful. I mean, beautiful. I couldn't even, I was like speechless, mesmerized. I couldn't stop staring at it. I didn't know this, this was God. I just kept staring and be like, wow. Like all those colors, the green, that rose pinkish color, the white, the, the layers, the enormity, just the, 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 the symmetry. I was like, whoa, I couldn't stop staring. And then my dad says, okay, we're going in. I was like, no, I don't want to go in. I can't stop staring at it. I was frustrated. I was mesmerized by it. So we went inside, and it wasn't as beautiful as the outside. And we had talked about this as a family, the beauty of the outside in comparison to the inside. My guess, I don't know, but my guess, and I think maybe I'm right, is except for St. Peter's, it's the opposite, the Basilica in Rome. But generally, these churches would be so beautiful on the outside, and you get inside, it was kind of like you felt like you wanted to like have more. And it was almost like a downer, unless you knew that Jesus was inside. Unless your faith and your heart was oriented correctly to see beauty itself. That exterior to me was the evangelizing principle. The power to bring people in, to call them in. It's not to say to not make it beautiful inside. I just think that maybe they made the outside so powerfully beautiful to help people in their weariness, in their boredom, in their temptation to say, like, it is worth going there. Look at it. I mean, it's so beautiful. It's more beautiful than my kitchen. Yeah, I'm going to Mass. I'm going to go stop in and say hi to Jesus. Because when I go in, I'm going to say hi to Jesus. Like, it's good to see these things, but really, I want to be focused on the Lord. Like, He's actually in there. So I'm like drawn in, and then I come in there, and there's just that mystery, that mystical encounter of the silence of, Lord, I know you're beautiful. I know it. You don't have to tell me anymore. I have come to believe. I know it. I just want to be with you. And if you inspire me to look at an image left and right, if it's you, I'll look. If it's not you, I ain't looking because I am fixed on you. That's what I want. You're the goodness itself that I want. You're the one I want to obey. But at that age of 10 or 12, I didn't get that yet. I was just bummed out that it wasn't more beautiful or as beautiful as the facade of that amazing church. And so I was bummed out. I was. I remember being bummed out, like, oh, what a downer. I just want to go back outside and see it. Faith comes by hearing. We have to be taught and then grow into the relationship to be wowed by the one who is beauty itself, Jesus, in the tabernacle. He's the author of beauty, the author of all that is good, the author of truth and symmetry and order and peace. He's the God of peace. But that's why we have to help people, and I needed help. Well, God brought some help, okay? First, um, growing up, I was a worry wart. Everything frightened me. I was kind of like a hypochondriac. Part of it, people could say, well, it's because your dad's a doctor. Yeah, true. I would hear all the time, like, illnesses and conversations about this, and this symptom means this brain tumor. And I was like, dang, man, I got a headache. I've got cancer. I was like, I've always got cancer. My, my foot's going numb. I've got a brain tumor. I know it because it's not possible to be numb on its own. I'm going to the doctor. I saw every doctor in the book because I was like, I've got cancer. And every time I had nothing, 99.9, except when I had like an allergic reaction, there was actually something there. It was horrible. I'm not afraid of it anymore. It got weeded out of me. At least I don't think I'm afraid of it anymore. I don't worry. But it was a, an agony to go through. So I get it. But it's not worth worrying about it. The point is, we're going to die. End of story. I get it that it's a frightening reality, but we're going to die. But if we're with Jesus, it's not like you die and it's this black place and, and it's over. If you don't want God and you don't confess your sins, well, then, yeah, it's over. You're really dead forever. But if you were with Jesus and you're trusting in mercy, it's like you close your eyes, but you're still alive. Your body went to sleep, but you didn't go to sleep. Your body did. And you're just there. 
You're in existence with God. Like, what more could you want? That's it. You're just moving on from this temporary life to eternity. The body died, but you didn't die if you're with Jesus. You should look forward to the moment. Because it's going to happen. It's going to be wonderful if we're with Jesus. Don't be afraid of it. So, at one point, my mother, she saw, she had started to come back to church. She started to have good friends reach out to her. Um, you know, cameraman Giuseppe? I've known him for about 20, 25 years. It was, his aunt was the one who was evangelizing us. We're just down the street. All of us Italians, we kind of hang out together, okay? So I've known Giuseppe for, for a very long time, and we're very Italian. And we love Italian food, okay? So this is part of human life, and God loves these things that we grow up with in love, okay? So, well, it's probably good to share that on a tired day, I'll reach out to Giuseppe still, and we'll go over to Four Brothers and just say, let's just get some pasta. And these are the things that God gives us. They're beautiful things that God gives us, and he's speaking in them. Remember, we're body and spirit, but we're not just spirit. The spirit is higher, but we don't neglect the body. God does not want us so fixated on the body that we make an idol out of it. We have to be careful. It is very easy to be fixated on the body and maintain it to such a degree that you miss out on what Jesus really wanted for you. And he's humble, and he'll be quiet, and he'll let you do what you want. We need to be surrendered people and let him lead us and enjoy the good things that he puts in front of us. And if he says not now, we surrender the good things that he says not now for something better that he's going to give us. We have to trust in his goodness. Otherwise, we're not going to be free. And we're not going to be able to evangelize people on what authentic freedom is on what the authentic freedom of the human person is. It's man fully alive, and that includes also the body, the temple of the Holy Spirit. My mother started going back to church, and she witnessed, it seemed like a miracle. The doctors were saying it's this, this, this um, uh, boy recovered. They had brought a statue of Our Lady of Fatima. It was Giuseppe's aunt who reached out to my mother because my mom was reaching out to the priest because this young boy was very injured in a hospital. And they brought the statue of Our Lady of Fatima, and he woke up and had like a 90% recovery rate to, the, to the, the amazement of the doctors. And so my mother realized, wow, God really works in our time now. It's not just 2,000 years ago in the gospel, of Jesus. Like, it's now. Like, that's, that's an epiphany. That's an awakening to something very real and very personal for me. Emmanuel means God is with us. God really is with us. But we do have to ask. We do have to come to him in faith. We do need to trust him because he can't force anything. These were moments of seeing the signs and wonders that moved my mother to want to follow the Lord. And Giuseppe's aunt would be calling us all the time. I remember that phone ringing like crazy, and I'd be like, no. Like, I don't want to hear any more about Jesus. Like, I'm tired of hearing about the commandments. I just want to watch my sports. But at the same time, I knew that that call was helping us. It was reminding us and would wake me up to higher things, the things of God that I needed, that I didn't really want. My mother, I remember one day, said, we're going to start going to Sunday Mass. Now, as kids... We knew from school, if you don't go to Mass on Sunday, you're going to hell. That's what they taught us, okay. There's a little distinction there. There are some people who truly can't get to Mass, okay? There are serious reasons. But if you can, and Mass is provided, and you're Catholic, you got to go to Mass. On Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation, there's no excuse, okay? That's a grave sin if you don't. you got to go to confession if that's happening to you, okay? But she said, we're going to Sunday Mass. And I was like, "Uh uh-uh, no, we're not. I was like... She's like, 11 a.m. I was like, no. I was like, football is at 11. Like, that's football time. Heck no. Like, are you kidding me? I'm 16, 17 years old, and I was like, no way. 
I remember just being like, no. But I knew it was good, and we listened. And we ended up going to confession, and I was freaked out. I was afraid I wasn't going to make it to the confession time, because now we were like making this journey, this transition. I'd lived for six years in grave sin. I knew it. I wasn't worried. I knew I was in grave sin. When the thought of hell came into my mind, it freaked me out. It happened about every six months, and I just pushed it away as quick as it came, because I was like, oh my goodness, hell, like, I'm going to be going there. If I don't change, I was like, no way, I'm not thinking about that. I want to live in my sin. I want my sin. I wanted it badly. And I took it, and God let me stay in my ugliness, in my death. He let me stay there until he said, enough is enough. And I remember going to confession, and I was so happy getting there because I was like, I'm so glad I didn't die over the weekend before I got here. I didn't understand how God works. I was like, man, I just got to get to that confession. Lord, please. And I got in there, and there was this old priest. He was a Holy Cross father. Father, you know, Son, Holy Spirit. And I was like, yeah, I confess. I was like, yeah, you know, like, I don't really go to, like, Sunday Mass. You know, he's like, well, you better put a halt to this. I was like, oh, man. I was like, the walls felt like they shook like thunder. It woke me up immediately. I was like, okay, I will go to Sunday Mass. Like, I was thinking, like, you're right. Like, I was, like, kind of trying to, like, wiggle my way around. But, you know, it's like, he's like, boom. Like, man, like, you're going to go to hell. He didn't say that, but it was like, you're going to go to hell. Really, if you don't want to change and you know God's ways, then you know where you're going to go. Look, you're free. But if you want to go to heaven, you have to put a halt to this. You have to. You don't have a decision otherwise if you want to make it to heaven. That's a commentary of the few words he said, and that confessional felt like it shook. I left walking, felt like I was walking on a cloud of peace. I felt like a feather. I didn't know that was grace. I didn't know that was God. I thought it was a psychological thing of I gave my sins and now I feel better because I'm not going to hell. Because right now I have no grave sin. I didn't know that that was God, like grace. I didn't know he was taking the weight off of me. I didn't get that. I just remember walking alongside the church to my mom's car being like, man, I feel light. I feel good. I felt like light, truly. I didn't know that these things happened. Unfortunately, I found it the bad way with a lot of sin, and then I experienced the other extreme of mercy. But God was still willing to do that for me. It shouldn't have been that way, but God allowed it to be that way and then showed me the magnitude of mercy for those kinds of sins and my ugliness. And I experienced a peace and a a lightness and a relief that I never knew. I didn't know it was a grace of God until years later. I wasn't told. I didn't ask. I didn't even know to ask. I just knew that I felt better. Did I get out of grave sin immediately? No. (laughs) It was a battle daily, weekly, monthly. It was a battle. It was a battle. And I would go to confession so I could get to the Eucharist on Sunday. And that's what it became, because I wasn't going to receive Jesus in an unworthy state anymore. Just wasn't going to do it. Wasn't going to do that to myself, at least. And so it was a battle every week or whatever it was. I want communion. I'm going to be at Sunday Mass. I have a grave sin. I'm going to confession. End of story. And I did, by the grace of God. By the grace of God, I had the heart to do that. I spent about six months in this kind of rhythm and routine of Sunday Mass, confession, Sunday Mass, confession, and in somewhat part of my junior year of high school, there's no way else I can explain it. It was like all hell broke loose outside, inside of me. I mean, I went through a darkness that to me, I see now as like an attack for having wanting to come back to God. I mean, things that I never had before. Depression. I was a happy kid. I was a worry wart. I had a quick temper for sure. I had a big mouth. I answered back a lot, right? But depression, I didn't know what that was by experience. I didn't know what that was. 
I listened to happy music. I liked rock music, but I listened to more happy, upbeat. I didn't understand the dark rock music, why people listened to it. I did once I got into this funk, for sure. Panic attacks, like I couldn't, I'd take a nap every afternoon because I'd be so drained from the anxiety and the agony of what I was going through. I would sleep for two to three hours and almost all the time wake up with a, a panic attack, anxiety attack, so extreme that my heart felt like it was going to explode out of my chest and I'd run out of my room. And then I'd find my dad on the couch watching TV and I'd be like, I would just be like in an absolute just terror. And he, you know, he's watching his son have this happen like four or five times a week. It was just horrible, horrible, suicidal thoughts, hate, feel like I hate myself. I felt like my friend, when she gave her testimony, a zombie. Yes. Like, I felt like I was in a vacuum, and it was just me, and everything else outside in the world was outside of this, like, glass ball that I was inside of. It's an agonizing way to live like that, and I'm sure many people are living that. I'm telling you, if you're listening, the answer is Jesus Christ. Yes, there are doctors. Absolutely. I come from a I wanted to be a doctor. I love medicine. It's biblical. It's from scripture. There's a translation that says, and the fool wouldn't take the medicine. That's from the Bible. It's God's word. But at the same time, it's not the end. The gift of doctors from scripture that God spoke about is a gift, but there are times also for miracles, for a direct intervention from God, a laying on of hands of praying, anointing of the sick, anointing with sacramental oil, receiving communion. God can heal cancer like that too. God can heal depression like that too. It's just not, to, but we have to use our prudence and wisdom that there are doctors who have been given a gift by God, psychologists, psychiatrists, for even afflictions like that. But while I say that, these kinds of anxieties and depression can also have a spiritual element. It can also be a demonic attack. So it's not to say it's only that and point to that, and it's not to say it's only to point at natural means or causes. It's to say it can be one or the other, and oftentimes both at the same time. And that's why it's so difficult. We are body and soul. But I didn't know these things. So I'm having horrible, crazy, wicked thoughts in my head, thinking I am this because I'm having these thoughts. I'm getting crazy thoughts like run your car off to the side and crash into the wall on the highway. Like what is going on with my life? Why is this happening to me? It's not you just because you have a thought. I was told once, yeah, if you have that thought in a dream, it means that's what you are. No, no, wrong, error, false, not true, goodness. There are sources of things that bother us in our dreams. And one of them is the evil one himself, the devil. If you don't believe in him, ask God to help you. He'll help you believe in him. It might freak you out. He exists, okay? But we'll leave that off to the side for now. He can affect you in your dreams. He puts a wicked thought in your dream. It is not the truth that that's what you are just because it happened to you. God permitted it. We got to be clear. The agony I could have avoided if somebody had told me who I trusted that clearly, I would have gone through years without an agony of feeling like I want to kill myself because of these thoughts. We have to be clear in understanding our faith. We have to be clear in understanding the church and her teaching. We have to be clear in understanding the psychology of the human person, which St. Thomas Aquinas understands very well. He understands the human person very well. God gave him that wisdom. God gave it to him. He's not archaic and out of touch with reality. To be out of touch with reality is to say that one who's been given wisdom by God 
is out of touch with reality. That would be out of touch with reality, to say that a saint who's been given wisdom by God is out of touch with reality. We cannot walk upside down anymore. We have to be clear with our youth. We have to be clear with the children in the world to say just because you have a thought that you might be a girl even though you're a boy does not mean that you have to now become a girl. No, I will not affirm that. I love you. If you're a boy, you are a boy. If you're a girl, you are a girl. And if you're struggling with that, we will walk with you. We will love you. But I am not going to tell you that you are something you are not. That is not right. That's called a lie. And the devil is the father of lies. Young people, it is a very difficult and confusing world. My heart, our hearts go out to you. But you have to understand a culture in itself may not tell you correctly who you are. A country and its leaders may not tell you correctly who you are. God created us and God tells us who we are because he designed us and it's beautiful. After he created creation, when he got to the human person, he didn't say it was good like everything else. He said, it's very good. We're way above giraffes, flamingos, beautiful things in creation, eagles, ocean, beautiful fish, way beyond. We're the image and likeness of God, okay? Wake up. Our Lord loves you. Our Lord loves you, and he does not reject you because you have brokenness. He calls you back to himself all the time. He wants you to come back, but you have to be humble and listen and not think that you know better than God. Trust him. He's good, and he's all-powerful, so he can back up the goodness. Here's the basis for our trust. I remember one time I didn't like to hear the truth told to me. I had a lot of pride. And I remember one time at a prayer group, an older man was talking about the commandments and he was rattling them off. And I was pissed. Man, I was angry. And I gave him a stare of anger that could have cracked walls. The, the hate in my heart, and I wanted him to know it and I wanted him to feel it. But I'm gonna tell you what the truth inside was. I knew he was right. What I showed on the outside was truly what I was trying to portray. But in the depths, young people, here we go. In the depths, there's probably many of you who know the teachings of God is true. And you don't like to hear it. Be humble. Accept that you have limitations, but listen to your Father in heaven because you can't deceive God. He sees in your heart that you know it's true. He sees in your heart that you believe it's true. And he sees in your heart struggling with hearing that you are maybe breaking one, two, or me, I felt like I was breaking all the commandments. In large part, I was. So I didn't want to hear Thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not. I was like, well, what can I do? Go to church? It's boring. That's what I can do? That's what I have to do? We got to explain to people what church is. We have to be loving and compassionate and explain the beauty of what's happening and not be rigid. The young people may not even know the name of Jesus. And we can't be rigid about whether there's incense or not. 
You don't have to have incense all the time. You don't have to have all the candles all the time. What you have to have is Jesus. Because the candle is not going to save them. We have to have a flexibility within the boundaries of God's will, within the boundaries of the teaching of the church. One who really loves and is desperate to have somebody saved will do whatever it takes apart from sin to get them home. They won't be fixated on candle, lights, incense, vestments. They won't be fixated on that. That's what I'm trying, I'm not trying to make a judgment, I'm saying they won't be fixated. They'll be fixated on God, and then from what they do, if they have those things, if their heart is right, then they're doing it so that they can get people in here. That's the point of canon law. It's for the salvation of souls. It's the last canon, the last law of the church. In the canons, that's the whole point of it. If God is willing to have holes put in his wrists and holes put into his feet, and it's sufficient to have two candles for a mass, then let it be. He has holes in his wrists. Don't bar people by rigidity. Don't bar people by pride and arrogance from letting people get into God's house. This is his father's house. Open the doors. Let in the young people into the church. Tell them about Jesus Christ and how he loved them and say, I didn't die for you. He did. I did not die for you. I'm going to show you the one who died for you and understands with you and has sympathy for you. He sympathizes with your weaknesses. He's been tested in every way but has no sin. He gets the test and he's victorious over it because he didn't sin. You can get out of your junk. You can get out of your misery. And if some people in the church are rude, forget about it then. Go to Jesus. But you got to stay in the church because it's the ship to get us home. The real presence of God is in the tabernacle in every Catholic church. You can stop in and talk to Him. You can ask Him to heal you. You can talk to Him about depression. You can talk to Him about confusion in your mind about whether you're a boy or a girl. Talk to Him. He knows you better than you know yourself. He's God. He'll help you. He'll wipe off the blood of pain in your life. He'll heal the wounds. He'll tell you, I forgive you, but he'll be clear with you. He'll say, don't sin anymore. It's making you miserable. Don't listen to the lies anymore that are not coming from my Father. It's making you miserable. Don't listen to the culture that's telling you and affirming you that you can change what you are in your humanity. No! God created you. He loves how you are. Even if you think you're ugly, forget about that. God wants you to be happy. So maybe physically at this point in your life you're ugly. Whatever. I get it. But that's not the end of life. In heaven, you're going to have a new body. You won't be ugly. If you have to bear with that now, there's a saint who was cast out from her family because she was hunchbacked and ugly. I think her her name was St. Margaret of Castellano. I forget. You can look it up. She was rejected. I think she was put into like a prison cell in her castle because she was ugly. And God made her a saint because she turned to Jesus in trust. In her pain, in her misery, in her rejection and abandonment. Oh my goodness. God hears your pain and he hears your cry. And he heard my cry. And he will heal you. I would go to adoration 
because my mom told me about a church that had, well, Giuseppe's aunt told us. <laughs> Always Giuseppe's aunt. And I would go, sometimes I would drive 30 minutes to St. Malachi's for Eucharistic adoration. I didn't know how to pray. I'd pick up a red book that they had, some traditional book, and I would just read it. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't wait until it was over because it was difficult. It'd take me 40 minutes. That's all I did. I didn't even talk to Jesus from the heart. I didn't know, I, I don't think I knew I could. But I, I heard it's him, I believe it's him. It was the only place where I found the slightest relief in my agony, and I would sit there in pain, away from all the craziness of my life, and just read out of this red book. And then I'd finish and drive home. He's there. Go talk to him. My life did not have what most people have. They say when they first come to God, they get all the honeymoon phase, the consolations. I didn't have that. I didn't have that for like a decade almost, like the real authentic consolations. I didn't have it. I had agony. I hung to God for dear life. There was a point where I started to feel peace at least. But consolations, these joys of the Spirit, no. In like 10 years, maybe a little less than that, maybe five, six, seven, I had twice, I think, a feeling of joy that lasted about two or three seconds. I did not have the consolations. I hung for dear life onto Jesus. And I'd pray every day at least three hours when this agony began, three hours, I would just be praying like all day. And my mom was praying all the time. I just clung to Jesus. And I felt nothing. I'm just telling you the truth. If you're a young person, it doesn't mean you're going to feel anything. I didn't. Except in that adoration chapel, I felt like it was quieter and more peaceful. But I was just in agony. <laughs> I didn't have peace. I didn't have consolations. Jesus saw me through it. He got me through it. So you can get through it. You have to get through it. You have to. You turn to him. You run to Jesus. A good mass for me was a late mass. Not because of the priest. I probably would have enjoyed that too, maybe. Because I didn't really want to be at mass. A late mass for me was get there at the gospel and leave before the blessing at the end. That's a good mass. Oh yeah. Homily bored out of my mind and I would show it. I would stand there at mass like this and I kind of wanted the priest, if I remember correctly, I wanted the priest to see that I just did not like this. I wanted him to understand that. Yeah, that's how I went to mass. Oh my. Okay. There was a time where I really struggled with thoughts. I felt like I should just be homeless. Yeah, I've got a nice car, but I'm miserable. Why would I have a nice car? I have a nice sports car, red car, but I'm miserable. I'm not happy. I should just become homeless. I get the homeless people. Yeah, I get it. I could live out there and it's Florida, so it's not cold. I could go live out there. I had a friend who was homeless in Wisconsin, a friend, I, I knew him when I walked down the street, I'd say hi to him all the time. And he said he lived in Florida as a homeless. I said, and you left? Too muggy out there for me, too humid. I said, so you come to Wisconsin to be a homeless in the cold? He preferred that, look, okay? So it's not guaranteed Florida, all right? But this is part of life and God worked with him too. At this time of my life, I made God a promise. I said, God, I promise you Sunday Mass for the rest of my life if you can get me out of this hell. I made that promise. I made like a bargain with God. I negotiated. When I got to college and I wanted to be a doctor like my dad, couldn't get the grade, so medical profession fell through. Then my best friend, we were skateboarding, all those kinds of things, right? So we were hanging out. He's like, I'm going to be a lawyer because he wouldn't go to school to class. I just couldn't get the grades, no matter how much I cried, prayed, got tutoring, whatever, 
okay? So he wouldn't go get the grades because he wasn't going to class. I wasn't getting the grades because I just couldn't get the grades. So he goes, I'm going to be a lawyer. I said, I'm going to be a lawyer. That sounds good. So I started taking classes of law after six months. I said, this is so boring. I said, forget it. I'm going undecided. I'm getting a band because I don't know what else I'm good at. I'm not capable of being a doctor. That's clear. I can't get into medical school with these grades. They're giving me a D because I'm probably going to deserve an F. But they're giving me a D because I probably went to tutoring. I cannot understand chemistry. So you got exam questions like this big. And you got 19 steps, 10 steps. You get one wrong. The whole thing is wrong. I was like, I can't pass these exams. They give you a calculator this big. I don't know how to use that calculator. They said, you can use the calculator. I said, I don't know how to use it. You've got about 100 buttons on this calculator. This is not going to help me. Are you kidding me? I played Nintendo growing up. I don't use a calculator. So, so I said, undecided. I got a band. And we wrote a lot of music. I wrote like 100 songs. I, wrote, I was writing, in my pain, two songs a day. Found a drummer. Finally found a bassist. It worked. And within one year, we were playing shows. By the third show, we were already pl playing in the biggest venue in downtown Orlando. We won a battle of the bands to open for a major label band. Some wild guy, um, he, he was saying, he, he, I don't know if he was telling the truth, but anyway, he came out with even with a contract and said, I worked with bands in LA or a California area, and I want to sign you. I'm glad I didn't sign it. <laughs> I don't know what I would have signed, but I'm glad I didn't sign a contract because I would have been bound by it because it was a legal document that he got. It was, it was official. And so we never opened for a major label band. I didn't pursue, the, the venue didn't come through. Um, but people could ask me, did you love playing shows? I loved playing shows. Did you love playing rock music? I loved playing and singing rock music. Did you want to smash guitars? Oh yeah. I had a guitar bought like at a pawn shop just for that. I'm glad I never did it. I'm not a famous band. I come into a venue where I'm playing a show and I break a guitar on their stage and put a hole in it. They're going to be like, you're paying for this or you're going to jail. <laughs> like, I don't care. You are not part of a famous band. Look what you did to the floor of my venue. Crazy. I lived wild. I should have been arrested for how I drove at least once. The cop didn't pull me over. He pointed. I thought, I'm going to jail tonight. It, it could easily, easily. I could not believe when he kept going. And he just put, and I changed right on the spot. I will never do that again. God knew that I would have probably despaired or I would have come close to despair. And he let me go. It was a mercy that exactly how I needed it. It did the job. Never, ever would I even consider, what was I thinking to do what I did there? The way we drove down the beach road, 35 miles an hour, pull the e-brake and make a U-turn in the middle of traffic. I mean, going through hills and neighborhoods and like crashing down into like the pavement and chair brakes. I mean, through neighborhoods, 80 miles an hour. You, this is nuts. This is crazy living. You can't live reckless like this. You can physically die. And then your life is over and you can't grow anymore in merit for your eternity. You can throw your life away. And God did not allow that to happen to me, but he could have. We were reckless reckless and I wouldn't be here if he hadn't protected me and shown a great mercy I wouldn't have been able to get to all these masses and confession and read the divine mercy diary because when I I, I had piercings when I got I finished a final exam uh, as a sophomore and as a gift to myself with my friend you should get your eyebrow pierced I said you are right I should get my eyebrow pierced and I went into a place that looked like a dungeon. I mean, the guy there had like beet red eyes, tattoos, and I wanted sleeve tattoos. I'm not, okay, look, I didn't want one tattoo. I wanted sleeve tattoos, but it was a decision to make. I got to play shows. So it's either going to be the amplifier, which I need for the shows, or waste my money, thousand dollars on sleeve tattoos, because I'm not getting just one. So I chose the amplifier. That's why I don't have any tattoos, because I wasn't going to just get one. And I got that, and I came home with this, this eyebrow piercing, whatever it was. I remember what my dad said. They were going to Mass. I was probably going to Mass at another time. He said, take it out or get out.
And I thought for a second about leaving. For a piercing, I thought about leaving. Can you believe that? That's living upside down. That's, un, that's ingratitude. That's blindness. That's hardness of heart. I'd be playing at Central Florida, middle of the night with my friends, blasting the, the guitar and amplifier in the parking garage. And the cops have to come and stop me. And in my arrogance, I said, but you liked it. It's, uh, it's un shocking. I can't believe I spoke like this. I can't believe it. I can't believe I lived like that. The language I had, the F word was like my only adjective. When I cut it out, I didn't know how to speak anymore. I'm serious. I remember saying to myself, like, I don't know how to describe it. Like, that's really good ice cream. Like, what do I say? Like, I don't know how to, it's good. And it's good soda. That's a great burger. Wow, life is boring. You know, like, I don't know what to say. Can somebody get me a thesaurus? Like, of anything, like, can you give me some words? I don't know what to say. F, this, S, that. What else do you need? Right? I don't know what to say. It was amazing to be mute. <laughs> so, go to a lot of rock concerts, a lot of shows. I've seen probably a hundred bands. And we would get in there, we'd sneak in, didn't get caught, try to sneak backstage by kind of lying, make it to be, be able to see my favorite band, because we're lying about, you know, <laughs> there we are, backstage, trying to get backstage, the bouncer wasn't having it, threw me about <laughs> 10 yards. I mean, just wild living, dumb. Going to racetracks, racing our cars. I mean, this is just how we live, but that was wholesome. But this is just normal life that we lived in Orlando, even just ra drag racing at an official place. It was fun, it was a lot of fun, okay? So then I got to college and I was still struggling a lot. And I remember I started going to mass. I was on the Sunday and I would also go at Tuesday. They had what was called Tuesday mass and meal. I was there partially for the meal, but there were two main reasons I was going to Mass. The first, I have to be honest, it was for the Eucharist. I was in so much pain that I said, I need Jesus. I got to get him one more time. But the other reason was because there was a girl I liked. It's just part of life. She was there, and that was like a magnet for me. So I'd go, and I was happy she was there. Just part of life. This is just normal life. Priests aren't robots. But I'm going to get to what God did for me. It was amazing what he did. And it's shared on EWTN, okay? I eventually went on a retreat because I played about 20 shows with my band. You're up until five in the morning by the time you get paid, if they pay you, by the time you clean up all your gear, by the time you drive home with a van that I think had one headlight and only two seats and our bassist would sit on the amplifiers in the back and we, the other one wasn't, well, anyway, the driving was wild. It could be wild. You get home five o'clock in the morning, you're buzzed because you have so much adrenaline and you're sleeping during the day. That's how I lived. I would sleep during the day and I'd be up all night. I'd be so tired, I remember there was one Sunday, 6 p.m. student mass, and I barely made it. I wanted to skip. I remember saying to myself, why couldn't they make mass later? And I came so close to skipping, to wanting to skip that it freaked me out not because I'm going to miss Mass and be in sin, but because all the hell in my life is going to come back because I'm going to break my promise. <laughs> so that's when I finally decided I'm going to go on the Catholic student retreat at the university that I've been avoiding out of fear for years. So I went on this retreat, and I remember we got to the cars. I had long hair, flannel shirts, because I thought I was bringing back grunge rock, if anybody knows what that is from the early 90s, okay? I, I thought I had a message for the world. I wanted to change the world. Okay, anyway, God had a much different plan. So I get to this retreat, and they said, okay, we're going to be in the car now. We're listening to praise and worship in the car. I was like, I was like, oh, no, praise and worship for two hours? Like, this is hell. Like, hell. So I tried to talk to the person next to me. She wouldn't respond. I was like, this is like hell. We get to the retreat. They said, okay, give us cell phones and keys. Uh, cell phones and watches. You're on God's time. I was like, we're on what? 
I remember they came in the first morning, and they're trying to wake us up to come to the retreat, and I remember the agony. I felt like knives were in my eyes of exhaustion. I knew it was early, but I said, I know it's early, but this is like really early. I don't know what time it is. I don't have a watch, but this is agonizingly early. And it, they had to come in multiple times to get me and another kid who had long hair out of our beds to get to the retreat. That first day of the retreat, half a day, I felt like I was dying. It was so difficult for me. It was just like five hours. But the next day, something began to happen. I remember somebody came up and spoke, and I thought he was ancient at the time. I was 21, and he was like 35. I'm 38 now, and I thought he was ancient. So I remember he said, he was giving us a talk. He was a good speaker. He was kind of charismatic. He said, how many times a week do you think I go to Mass? And I thought to myself, four, five. If he goes more than that, he's a freak. And he goes, seven. I go, I thought to myself, he's a freak. He's a freak. I mean, he goes to Mass every day. Okay? I had no idea that after this retreat, God would put such a fire in me to want to get to Mass every day. Every day. The days I would go to Mass, I wouldn't fall into grave sin almost every time. The days I wouldn't make it to Mass, when I didn't get the Eucharist, I'd fall into sin, grave sin, almost every time. And it was a real moment for me to be like, it is Jesus in the Eucharist. Because when I was on that retreat, they had Eucharistic adoration. And to my arrogance, I thought, yeah, I know what that is. I was kind of proud about it. I was proud thinking, yeah, I know what this is. I've been there. I know what to do. And they started to play a praise and worship song. God will meet us in humility. Boy, I would not want to be converted in something I don't like. And they played a song, and there was a moment in the song where it says, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sins upon that cross. And it went through me like an arrow, like an arrow. And I felt like a word came from the host, hypocrite, for me. And I believed it. Because I'd leave Mass, give people a smile at the sign of peace, but I hated them. At least I felt like it. And I'd get out of Mass, and I was a jerk. I remember my friend says, you're so kind in Mass, and look at you now. I was like, I was like yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> Don't want to hear that, but true. It's true. You're right. This is ridiculous. But how do I change? It's so hard. So, I didn't want to be a priest. At 19 years old, a thought came priesthood. Simple thought. And immediately my response was no. And I meant it. I said nope. And I lived my life as I wanted to live. And about every six months, just like that whole confession thing, a thought would come in. No lie. I'd be playing, practicing with my band and the drummer is drumming. And I'd have this thought be like, I'm going to probably become a priest. Like, and it felt like true. Like it felt like a reality. And it's like my whole life was, I'm going to be in a band. I will live in a van. I'm going to do this until I'm 30. I'll go on tour. We were going to go all over the States. I considered going across the seas, possibly. I'm doing this. I don't care how much it costs. I'm a business major with a marketing minor. I'm not paying nobody to do this. We don't have any money. I'll eat poor. I'll live poor. And we did. And I will do everything for the business. And I will do everything for the marketing. I'm in charge. Nobody could convince me. They tried. Family, you shouldn't do this. You should have a real job. Focus on your education. This band isn't going to work out. Anger, I'm not listening to one word you say. I will not change. Are you kidding me? No way. I am fixed on my decision, and that's the end of the story. So we can eat tacos at this Mexican restaurant, and you can speak for two hours about what you believe is correct. But I'm not going to take any of it to heart. So might as well just eat our tacos. That's how I'm living. That's it. End of story. Well, I have this conversion experience. I start going to Mass. And I make a prayer because I didn't want to pray the rosary. It was too long. So I decided I'm going to pray a divine mercy chaplet every day for my vocation because it's half the time. So I did that. 
And I one day had a moment where I was praying, and this was one of the two feelings of joy I ever had prior during these years. I was praying it, and I looked up at the crucifix, and this like joy that I could not produce came. And I said, God, I'm so happy. I'll even become a priest. And then it went away, and I was like, no. I was like, I can't believe I just said that. I was like, that is such like, you, like a dupe. You duped me completely. That's not fair. That's not fair. I was not happy. Well, then I got into focus. I wanted to do missionary work. I wanted to go overseas, India, Philippines. Philippines was the first place I thought of. A priest from the Philippines was helping me. And I thought about that. And I ended up finding a group called Focus, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. And they did mission work, but I heard in the summers they'd go to foreign countries. And that's because of this inspiration I had, and that was like the bait that I took, the foreign mission possibility, I signed up. And to my almost like amazement, within like two weeks, I was already like accepted. You couldn't, you couldn't make these things up the way it was happening. God was like, look, you've been away for so long. I'm just going to just pummel you with what I've always wanted to give you. Wake up. I went to the interview for Focus, and before it, I had to clean my earrings. I had like a little bit gauge. They were kind of bigger, so it made a bigger hole in the earlobe, and I had to clean it because it can get infections, and I was cleaning it. I'm like meticulous. I'm so careful with things, and I, and I cleaned one set, and the water hit my palm, and literally the thing flew out. I had no stopper in the sink, and it went right down the drain, and I was like, so the next time when I cleaned the other set, I was like, oh, I know how, what happened, so I'm going to be very careful. So I put very gently the water, put it in my hand, it hit it, and did the same thing. I thought, maybe God doesn't want me to have my earrings anymore. Bummer. Bummer. I like those things. So God will do some things that seem so unbelievable, almost miraculous, just to get us to pay attention. There's no possible way that that thing could have popped out of my hand unless God did something. Maybe an angel threw it off my hand and said, wake up, son. Stop being rude. So I was in focus. I was in Wisconsin. My first, second month there was September. It was the middle of September of 2007. And I was watching a trailer of the Fishers of Men video, which came out about 20, 15 years ago, I forget. It's a, it's a video about 20 minutes encouraging vocations to the priesthood specifically. And they made a trailer that was about two minutes. I had seen it weeks before. My friends in Kansas, when we were training for Focus, showed it to me. I had like an emotional response. Yeah, we got to help. It's like enlist for the army. You may not be able to like actually join the army, but you feel like, yeah, I'm going to go join the army. We've got to fight the battle. And then a week later, when the shells were exploding, it's like, well, maybe I'm not as excited about it as I thought I was. This is, this is a lot of suffering. This is intense. It's not just a consolation of we're going to go fight a battle. That's what I had the first time I watched this video. The second time, something happened to me so extraordinary that I know it was God. I mean, there's, I, don't, I can't prove it, but there's no way I can say what happened to me was like a blueprint was put into me, and it just said priest. My life literally felt like it went like this. My desire for priesthood and the good, normal desire for marriage, which is just part of life, which was up here, flipped like this. It was so powerful that I thought to myself, oh, that's how you make your priests. I could absolutely give up marriage, for sure. No doubt. I was free now. When I was looking at the girls inside of the student center, in my mind beforehand, even though I thought maybe it's possible priesthood, I was always thinking about dating. If I'm going to talk to her, I'm thinking about dating. That's always in my mind. And there's a good there. God created us this way. It's part of the life. I'm thinking about marriage. When that happened, it was gone. I'm not saying desire for like marriage disappears. God doesn't make us a robot. But I was no longer talking to the girl at that front desk the same way. I couldn't. I'm called to be a priest. I saw her completely different. It wasn't, what can I get out of this so we can date at all? She was beautiful, but I wasn't thinking about that. I was like, I'm thinking, I'm called to be a priest. How are you? That's how I was talking to them now. It was unbelievable. 
It was unbelievable what God did. And it's remained. That was 2006, seven. It's remained. He hasn't changed the call. When I applied to the seminary, I remember telling my friend, I was like, to my bummer, because I was like, it is going to be hard. I was like, I'm probably going to be accepted. I was like, the way my life is going, the way God has worked, they're probably going to accept me. And I got accepted. And I wasn't surprised. I was like, of course. I was like, of course. Of course. No band, no marriage. For sure, what you've done in my heart is so powerful, is so clear for me, that of course they're going to accept me. I wouldn't accept it. I wouldn't have called me. But it's going to happen probably. I remember telling my friend just like that, they're probably going to accept me, man. <laughs> it's true. When I was in focus, I went through a lot of temptations to despair. I'm going to wrap this up now. I went through a lot of temptation to despair of my, my salvation. I thought with more sins, you have less chance for heaven. On some level, that's true. If you have a lot of grave sins or even one and you don't confess it, you're not going to go to heaven. You've got to give it to Jesus. Confess it, and then you're, you're good. I thought if I committed so many of these sins, it's like God's mercy is decreasing. And I have less chance. It's going to be harder for me. As if God is changing the way he treats me. God doesn't change. So I'm, my friend gave me in Lent the diary of St. Faustina. And I was reading it. I read about half of it in like a week or two. And then the other half took me about six months. And I started to have peace in my heart. I was reading it in adoration. And I read a line that said, the greater the sinner, the greater the right he has to my mercy. My life, again, flipped upside down. I should say it flipped right side up because I heard now the truth and now I was going to stand in it. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe what I just read. I could not believe that the greater the sinner, the greater the right. It makes sense though. If I have a heart problem and I'm in the ER, I'm going to get medical attention quicker. I'm going to have a greater right than somebody who comes in with a broken nose. Even if they've been waiting five hours and I come in after they've been already waiting five hours, I've got a heart condition that can kill me. They're going to take me first and give me the best medical attention. I have a greater right because I have a greater need. I have a greater misery. And everybody would say, that is just. That's correct. That's fair. That's wise. That's love. That's mercy. That's true mercy. That's the way we are to live. That's how God treats us. You are really sick. I'm going to run to you because you are broken down. You need help. If I don't run to you, you're not going to make it. <laughs> End of story. I've got to run to you. So I found this, and I went online, and I was looking for religious communities at the time. I looked at contemplative communities, foreign missionaries, dioceses, Franciscans, because I liked Padre Pio, so I thought I was always going to be a Capuchin, but when I looked at their charism, I was like, it's not me. It's just, it's not my call, as beautiful as it is. I can't live that for my life. I couldn't live any of them for my life. I knew it. But I went online looking for divine mercy material, and I found the Marian Fathers. And when I got to the vocations page, after seeing the charism, Maculate Conception, Souls in Purgatory, Greatest Need They Serve, and they have this gift of divine mercy, which is what I'm reading. And then I went to the vocations page, and it was Father Calloway, the priest that my mom had showed me two years earlier. Her friend gave her a VHS copy of this wild conversion story that actually spoke to my heart, even though I didn't want to watch it at first. You're kidding me? That crazy priest? The one that God worked that much in, my, in his life? The one who made me think after I watched it? Oh man, I thought I had an excuse to not be a priest. Like I thought I've done, been so bad, like now I, I took consolation, like God will never call me now. And then when I saw him, I was like, dude, he's probably worse than me and he's a priest. I was like, oh, I was like, man. <laughs> but there was hope there, right? Because I saw the good that God did. You know what got me to listen? Father Calloway wasn't acting. He was just being himself. I'll tell you what got me, because I wasn't listening. I didn't trust priests. I didn't. He said in this, just in his talk, just speaking as he spoke, he said, dude. And I thought, that's my language. 
and a wall went down, and I started to listen. That's all it took. It wasn't the miracles, though they touched my heart. It wasn't the conver uh, all the other crazy stories. It was the reality of what he spoke is what God used to bring down the wall to get me to listen. I can't understand God. So I'm going to give you two quick stories of confession and rosary, and then I think I'm going to play just that song that helped me with my conversion to show you that now I try to glorify God with my music. I don't play just for me. I don't play just for my own sake of being glorified. I play because God gave me a gift that I didn't ask for. I practiced to get better at it, but I didn't give it to myself. And he's going to ask me at the end of the day, how did you use it? Did you use it? And how did you use it? And I'm going to have to answer him. <laughs> I'm going to have to say, yeah, oh, I did it all for me. He's going to be like, well, that wasn't good. Or I'm going to be like, well, I tried my best to do it for you. I wasn't perfect. He's like, that sounds about right. Come into the kingdom. I saved you. You were able to do it because I saved you. I love you. I went to confession once, and I had this like phobia for like nine months. It was like this like, oppressive fear, and I couldn't sleep at night. I, it was just horrible. It lasted about nine months. I went to confession one night to this old great priest. He was a missionary. He had been kidnapped twice. Amazing story. His community made him write a book about it. Wonderful, powerful story, but gentle like a lamb. I confessed my sins. Didn't even mention this fear. I didn't know you ha could mention it. It wasn't on my radar screen. As he gave the absolution, his hand went across. I felt like I saw, not with my eyes, but I saw somehow like a beam of static electricity come out of his finger and it went straight towards my heart. I didn't feel anything. But I know when I left and I went to my room, that fear was almost completely evaporated and I slept like a baby for the first time in nine months and it's basically been gone ever since. It's been whatever 2007 is. I can't count well, okay? It's been gone. Jesus says to St. Faustina, the greatest miracles happen inside of the confessional and that they are incessantly repeated. He said to her, I'm only hidden by the priest when you come to confession. So I met Jesus of Nazareth. There is a surprise factor when it happens, but I shouldn't be like ultimately surprised that God does these things. He created us out of nothing. Try doing that. If you have nothing to work with and you can create something, he can heal you of a phobia, okay? The last one was, I hated flying. I would get anxiety like nobody's business. I felt like running away from the gate. I had so much anxiety flying, crashing, dying. Am I gonna go to hell? Oh my gosh. So, and my hands would be so sweaty. I got into this plane, I think I was going to the summer training for focus, and I began a rosary. I began it, I prayed it by the creed, just, beginning the creed, a peace went from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, so extraordinary that I wanted to almost sh jump up and start shouting that everybody should pray the rosary. But you can't be doing that. You can't be doing that on a plane, okay? I mean, they, they might come and tackle you if you start acting like that. You got to be prudent about things, okay? Dude, this guy's wild. Like, how do I know he's got a rosary in his hand, right? I mean, you have to be prudent. But I had this desire to say it because of what happened. I believe it was that day I finished it, fell asleep. I think I woke up as the tires were hitting the ground. Unheard of for me. I slept through the whole flight, two-hour flight. Our Lord is in the Eucharist. The Eucharist is Jesus. We got to just take him at his word. He says it in scripture. This is my body. This is my blood. End of story. Do this in remembrance of me. He's God. Take him at his word. He's in the confessional. He gives the apostles on Easter. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Whose sins you retain are retained. He breathed the Holy Spirit upon them. They've got the power to forgive sins because God gave it to them. He gave it to priests. I'm a priest. Can't forgive myself. I go, to, I go to confession to a priest. But I can forgive people of their sins because Jesus of Nazareth is so humble that he shares it with me. He's really in there. I love thinking about that. I say, Jesus, you be the confessor. I'm not a robot. I'm not a puppet. But I can't do this. I surrender to you, you be the confessor, you do it. And I surrender to him, he's there. And then the rosary, Our Lady, the Immaculate Conception, the masterpiece of mercy, the Virgin of Nazareth, who gave us Jesus, who said yes her whole life long to the will of God. When you pray the rosary, 
It's not just a boring mechanical prayer. That's not what it's meant to be at all. It can feel boring. It can feel mechanical because it may not feel good, and you may have to say, as you do, a lot of Hail Marys. But the point is it's of the heart and also of the mind. You've got to know what's going on. You're with the Blessed Mother. Wouldn't you be excited to be there with Mary? And you're thinking about the reality of an alive mystery of the life of Jesus that's impacting your life and your soul in that moment because he's God. He did everything as God. So it's all participating in divine eternity. You think about the Annunciation, the grace of what happened that day is impacting your life now in 2023. You're not just thinking about a mystery. You're encountering it with the Virgin Mary of Nazareth and Jesus. And it's not just them, but these are the people you're going to be praying with. And the devil's frightened of the rosary. Pray it. I'm going to play a song, okay? This is the song that I heard uh, on that retreat. I'm just going to play a little bit of it and that verse where I felt the conversion take place. When that moment happened in front of the Eucharist and they were playing that song and that kind of big kind of moment happened for me on that retreat, I felt like a fire hydrant started to come out of my eyes. I was so embarrassed because I was like, I don't cry. And it was like, oh my goodness, like I couldn't control it. I ducked for cover. I just ducked down because you're like with 50 people, all your peers. But then I saw one of the bigger guys who was like a few years older than me. He had tears in his eyes. I thought, okay, solidarity, you know? So... Um, but look, the Lord, if you, if you have like tears over your sins, over the fact that you hear something beautiful in a homily or in the gospel or whatever of God, let it be. Okay? You don't have to be wailing inside of the mass. I mean, you can, we have to can have some control over ourselves. But it's okay to have, shed a tear. There's a gift in that. It could be healing you. It could be cleansing you. It can be an offering of sorrow for your sins. And it's like repairing the damage that you've done or that's been done to you and you're healing in that moment. Let it be. This song is called Here I Am to Worship. Jesus. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you for listening. God bless you. How exactly will the judgment occur? When we appear before our Lord after death, will the Lord tell us, you go to hell, you go to purgatory, and you, with me to heaven? No. Nothing like that. God is the good Father. We will see God face to face, with open arms. And it is we who will say, No, Father, I cannot get close. My clothes are stained. How can I appear like this before all saints and angels? I'll change my stained clothes. I'll go to purgatory and dress nicely. Then I will come and be with you forever. Purgatory is the place that cleanses us.